So um, this, this panel is actually called in the program uh, Music Industry Success Panel. Um, I don't quite know what <laughs> we were trying to work out what, uh, what that was all about. But first of all, I'll introduce the people on the panel. Uh, on the end here, we've got uh, Mr. Simon Hayworth, who's from Super Audio Mastering, which is a local mastering uh, setup he's got uh, just out on Dartmoor. And um, Simon goes back many years. He was a recording engineer through the 70s uh, for various studios. And we actually worked together um, mm. at the end of the 70s. We worked together. And since then, Simon's been mastering. Um, then we have uh, Roger O'Donnell, who's a keyboard player, works with The Cure for many years, and, um, and also uh, done solo albums, released his own records. Uh, he tours and got extensive experience um, and knows all about keyboards and <coughs> lots, of, lots of other things, I'm sure. And on my right here, we've got uh, Michael Riley, who's um, one of the founding members of uh, Steel Pulse. And he's a uh, man of many talents and uh, actually got, um, got a project, which uh, I hope we have time to talk about, called Bass Culture, which is kind of tracing the history of bass frequency um, in British music <coughs> and the way it's kind of um, challenged the world and influenced the world, you know? Um, and it's a very interesting subject that he's made me aware of. Uh, he also teaches and plays and um, does lots and lots and lots and lots of other things. And on the end, we've got uh, Richard Barbareri, who was um, a, a keyboard player with uh, the group Japan and Porcupine Tree as well, and also done solo records and, uh, and played lots of concerts and... Um, you know, is, I'm sure he's got lots to say about music and things in general. Um, so I'm going to start off. And uh, the, the, first, um, the first thing was the, the, the title of this. I don't know who gave the title. It was Music Industry Success Panel. And we did have a conversation earlier because we haven't really met before. So <coughs> we had quite a stimulating uh, conversation. How do you measure success uh, in in today and uh, in, in the digital world, you know, with the internet and everything being open for um, different things. So, um, Roger, I don't know if you could start. <laughs> oh, <thanks. laughs> you were, yeah, you, um, we were, when we were talking, you were saying that today's success isn't just about, was it about being successful in your career or successful in, in um, I think yeah, for a professional musician, um, you measure success by um, album sales and ticket sales for touring, and uh, I think that's changing considerably, especially in terms of selling records. As we all know, that record sales have um, more than halved in the last 10, 15 years, and will go on uh, diminishing as downloading becomes more accepted, well, not accepted, but more prevalent, if it could be. I mean, I think it's pretty much well established. So judging your success is, um, it's a difficult thing. It depends on w what stage you are in your career. Um, uh, for me, I have two se entirely separate spheres that I operate in. My solo work, where I'm... I recently performed in London a, a requiem that I collaborated on, and I was very happy that we had a hundred people come uh, for a Cure show. If we get less than fifty thousand, then it would be considered not a success. So mm -hmm. you have to take uh, into account where you are in your career. Also, when the Cure started, they were probably happy to uh, play to a hundred people. Um, and in terms of record sales. We, nobody sells records anymore, I mean, mm. uh, unless your name's Adele, and she sold 21 million. Um, but if you can sell... A friend of mine owns a record label, quite a, an influential label called Arts and Crafts in Canada, and he judges success with his bands if they can sell 5,000. If they sell 10,000, then uh, 
they are very successful um, selling 5,000 records, he's probably not going to pay for your mastering costs. So, <laughs> so uh, it's a very difficult situation. It's difficult to know where you are successful and what success means to you. I mean, for me, I'm just happy making music. I'm lucky that uh, success doesn't have to mean money anymore because of the past when um, being able to make money was a lot easier than it is now. Mm. Yeah, because being successful isn't, isn't necessarily a financial success. It can often be it, a, it depends artistic on, success. Yeah, I mean, we all love artistic success, but if you've got to pay the mortgage or pay your rent or put petrol in your car to get to that mm. successful gig, then it's, it's difficult, mm. isn't it? Sometimes for me as a producer, a success is often when I finish a record, when I've produced or mixed a record, and the band all love it and the record company love it, and I think, oh, wow, this is a success. You yeah. know, even though it doesn't sell, you know, the funny thing <laughs> with a record is that you, know, you can feel, you can feel uh, a great achievement you know, of, of, of when a record's done and, and everyone's happy with it. You know? Um, should I pass on to, to Michael, just that like, idea of <coughs> success? <laughs> <coughs> um, well, for me, cer certainly success is kind of connected the, to the word career as well. Um, I'm, I'm now, uh, amongst my other kind of jobs, uh, head of music uh, production at the University at Westminster. And we have these conversations on a regular basis, certainly with students. And the idea of success, I, I agree, it's, it's on an individual basis, but um, I think that increasingly success, uh, one, it's being able to do what you want to do. And for my, my case, it was always avoiding having a regular job. Um, it, to me, it's the ability to constantly reinvent yourself within our industry, which is very disposable. Um, we were looking at the careers of musicians recently, and uh, even the term career is an odd one. Um, but it was a length of time that someone uh, was seen by the industry to be successful. And that was down to something like four to six months, at which point um, you were considered spent. Um, and the frightening thing about that was that you might have spent years getting to the point where the industry recognises you as being successful, uh, or decades. Mm -hmm. But once you get there, um, staying there was the challenge. Staying there was the measure of success. So certainly in my case, every I looked at it that if I'm going to stay <coughs> avoiding what I call regular work, I had to reinvent myself on average every three years. So in the 70s, I was part of bands. In the 80s, uh, I was a producer and producing uh, well, anything I could get my hands on and that was a range from Jamiroquai to Soul to Soul to odd bands like E17's first album, Peter Andre, Bjork, um, uh, even Wet Wet Wet. Um, but anything the management could get on, uh, get me on to was considered a success. But by the 90s that all changed again. So I think as musicians, we're constantly looking at being flexible around the term success, because mm -hmm. um, there's a danger of being too rigid. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. to be honest, I, I just look at it in terms of <laughs> not working, not doing a regular day job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Um, and one thing, one thing that I'm curious about is, is uh, with the musicians on stage, is do you think it's a good thing to, for <coughs> musicians or young people to stick to one kind of music, one genre of music, or do you think musicians should spread out into uh, and encompass different fields? Like, um, you know, I'm not saying you use it, uh, uh, play a different instrument, but I'm, I'm curious, like, I'm, I'm working with a band at the, mo uh, at the moment, and it, I've reflected on other bands I've worked with, and I've noticed that very often they only play with the people in that band, like they never mm -hmm. kind of branch out and, and play with other musicians. Um, 
I'm just, I'm just curious whether, whether anyone should give advice to young musicians to say, well, stick, stick to what you're doing that's, that's good, mm. or whether they should explore other territories, you know? I think, I think the, the important thing is uh, to know very early on if you want to be a musician, if you love music and you want to be involved in the music industry, whether it's engineering, live sound, or as a musician, or as an artist, it's whether you, you want that or you want fame. And I think a lot of kids are confused these days about uh, success related to fame, um, being known, having a claim, being mm. justified. Mm. And that's a very kind of rocky road because um, fame can go up and down. I mean, Elton John writes his chart positions to this very day in a little book. And that's not to make light of it, you know, because that at the beginning, that's really what was important to him. Yeah. And, and it still is. Um, but, you know, you go down that route and there's always the, the worry, the worry that something's not going to be as successful. For me, success is um, being able to do what you love doing and make a living from that. Um, whether it's selling out the Marquee Club or the Albert Hall, um, it feels a success. It's mm -hmm. like when you say you finished the record, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's something that I feel comfortable with. It doesn't matter the scale. Uh, it's the fact that you feel happy that you've been able to do something that you love and, you know, not do something you hate, which can, you know, make people's lives very difficult. How do I measure success <laughs> in the music industry? Well, I know I, I come from a technical background, recording studios and, and those kind of facilities. So I'm going to talk about that because I think that um, there's probably quite a lot of people here who are technical technicians, engineers, and so on. And I think every day I strive for success when trying to make it the best technically. And, you know, it's a real buzz when someone says it's great, sounds great. Throughout the years, I've been involved in a number of successful recording studios that have been built from the ground up with people starting with a blank sheet of paper. And I, you know, Every day, you'd strive to create some kind of successful outcome on the day, whatever it may be. It could be, you know, um, designing a room. It could be um, mending a broken tape machine. It could be any aspect of the technical aspects of running a facility or building one. So you have to look at all these. It's an interesting... It's an interesting uh, name for this panel because it does conjure up all sorts of, you know, ideas and thoughts about where where we are now in terms of the technical aspects of making records. Um, perhaps in days gone by, we were more, you know, it was like a big team of people making a record. It was the recording studio, the T boy the bookings girl, everybody got involved in making records, you know, who's coming in this week? And so everybody got focused on, on, on that band in the, in the studio in trying to make it a success. It wasn't only going to be a success, um, you know, if, if they, you know, you know if, if, if everybody wasn't focused on it, it probably wouldn't be a success. You know, you wanted everybody to be happy, you wanted to create a good atmosphere, and you wanted all the, all the equipment to really work well. So it was a really huge team effort to make these things happen in, in terms of making records, you know. And as John said, you know, at the end of a, of a session or, or of an album, you know, everybody, you say goodbye to everybody and you'd go, wow, that was great, that was a success, you know. <laughs> Hopefully, it wasn't a big disaster. Yeah. The place didn't burn down, maybe. Yeah. But, you know, that, so, and then during the 80s, I was involved in a big um, uh, post-production outfit in London. And, 
you know, our, our kind of aims were, were, were delivery. Kind of delivery for us was the big word, you know. And if you got to the end of a day, you know, with all these different jobs from mastering to copying to duplication to, you know, all, all sorts of dealing with lots of people, um, if you got to the end of the day without a major mishap, that was, that was a big success, you know, a really big success. And, and it was fantastic, the energy involved in all these aspects of making records. So, you know. Um, but, you know, it's interesting, this industry, people buy people, you know. That's, you know, that's what we're in. We're in, in, in an industry where the, that the, the success of, of, any, of any aspect of it, where it's designing a printed circuit board to divide, designing some piece of software that's going to enable um, a b better EQ or better co audio compression or, or better um, uh, data compression even and so on. All of these tools are ratified and become successful via various industry bodies like the AES, for example. So, you know, we're, we're, we're all striving for success all the time, mm -hmm. you know, every day, never stops, never goes away. And that's what puts the edge on what we do. I think that's what makes great records. It's what, um, yeah, it's a buzz. Mm -hmm. Can I just <laughs> pick good. up on the point about yeah. people? Yeah. Um, I think that's <clears throat> absolutely central to, on occasions, to that whole notion of success. Um, certainly with the musicians and the students that I interact with on a regular basis. Um, increasingly, it moved into the area where it was about the individual and the individual working on their own, whereas initially it was about a community, mm. of in, you know, whether it's the band or the individuals that surrounded the band. And I find increasingly in today's market we're, we're actually talking to, uh, certainly in my case, to students about the value of recognizing success in another individual, recognizing the success or the potential for success via the process of communication. Because most of the time what we're attempting to do is simply communicate through music. Um, and if the conversation is with yourself and not with those that surround you and your potential audience, then there is that potential that you're restricting your potential dare I say it again, for success. So to me, a lot of that whole notion of success is about people um, mm. and the ability to have that conversation through music. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to say that um, yeah, studios used to get a reputation of being hit factories and people would go to a certain studio because it had a certain vibe and, and then, of course, it became self-generating and so it wouldn't necessarily... But the, there would be a string of hits that would come out of a studio and that was... Part, I mean, obviously it was the band, but it's to do with the people that work there, the engineers and the tape ops and the, the tea lady or whatever. But so much now, so much music now, and that's what Michael's saying, is being made at home in people's studios. The bedroom studios, and which I'm hugely in favour for in, in the way that it democratises music, because you don't have to spend... Well, to go into a recording studio today is going to cost you at least £500 a day. I mean, even a basic one. And that's a lot of money. For £500, you could set up your entire home studio. So you end up working on your own. I do. I've got my own studio at home. And I don't interact with anybody when I'm making my record, unless I involve a singer. And they're usually thousands of miles away, and we just share files over the internet. The only person that I end up interacting with eventually is the mastering engineer, um, which is the only part of the old-fashioned, not necessarily old-fashioned thing, John, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the old, the old way, the old chain, you know, you make demos, way, yeah. the traditional route, mm. you make demos, you, then you go into work with a producer and then so forth and, and mix an engineer. But now I end up just with a mastering engineer and that's the only person that I work with. So that person has become even more important to me um, but he's the only person, not Simon actually, we haven't worked together, but um, that's the only place where I feel the, nest, the need to spend money these days. John being a producer, I'm sure has got many reasons. There's mm. huge amounts of things that you can come, that come out of working with other people. 
So I think working on your own at home is great because you, everybody can afford to do it. And it means that everybody can make music if they're that way inclined. And it's of a great standard. But you, you do lose, as Michael was saying, that human interaction, which is hugely important in music. That's one of, one of the saddest things about studios closing down. You know, everyone says, oh, so-and-so, the studio's been going for 25 years and it's closed down, and there's many of them, is that you've lost the, uh, the interaction of people within the studio. Yeah. Like, I, 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 st I don't have a studio at home, and, and, and I'm all for going to, to studios uh, so that I can mix with other people and so the band can mix with other people. You know, there used to be studio complexes where there was a building with maybe three or four studios. I remember a studio, <laughs> I don't know if Simon wants to remember, it was called Matrix Studios in London and it was, it was near the British Museum and it was down a basement. Um, and at one time there were five studios there five SSL studios and it was all run, it was run 24 hours, it was, the sessions ran from noon till midnight, midnight to noon, so when you finished at midnight another <laughs> band was waiting to come in and that's how it was run. There was five studios, there was one kitchen and one kettle mm. and so <laughs> this is true yeah. and so you met, you know, if you were in one studio there were another four bands there, there was, you know, there might have been 50 people down in this basement, all musicians, all making records, all for major record companies as well. Um, I think yeah, a lot of the... Um, it's sad that all that's kind of gone and it was yeah, very inspiring for each other, you know, because you'll be listening at the door and go, wow, oh, listen to that. Yeah. I think <laughs> that whole social aspect and the atmosphere of a studio is intrinsic to some of the albums that were made, you know, it's, time, it's yeah. an important thing. Uh, we used to record at a studio that's not there anymore called Air Studios uh, in, in London, which was above Topshop in Oxford Street. Mm -hmm. And it was an, um, you would have Paul McCartney basically in every day at Studio Two. Uh, George Martin, his producer, would ride his bike down the corridor every morning. You'd, Kate Bush would be in the other studio opposite in three. Tears for Fears would be in Studio Four. And it, it kind of impacts on you that there are all these kind of great artists and there's all this creativity going on in this one building. And you'd get to know the people who ran the studio. You could work all night. And there'd just be something exciting about it. And I think that adds to the chemistry of the group and to the whole vibe and of the And the finished thing. sound of the record, in a way. The and the sound. The, the the, you know, the engineers you wanted work there. You, 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 you listened to albums that you liked and you said, who, who produced that? You know, I'm interested in maybe we should work with that person and, and one thing led to another. And it would just become a special kind of time. And I don't think, you know, however equipped your, your home studio is or you bring mates around, or it just doesn't have the same vibe for me. No. Well, I'd like to defend the alternative <laughs> because that, being in a studio, well, in the old days, say if you had two months to make an album. That became very focused for everybody. Fair enough if everybody's focused and everybody's thinking in the right direction at the same time. But now when I work at home, it's just when I go into my studio, it's just like going into my kitchen. When I press record, it's like turning the kettle on. It's a very natural, honest process. And there's no pressure. Uh, I know think good things can come from pressure. Yeah, I think the pressure's good. But <laughs> not everybody, you know, when the red light goes on, everybody goes, <clears throat> It's horrible, you know, uh, through your career that, that relaxes and you get better at it. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you do get to a stage where you're comfortable in a studio, but, you know, you know that the clock's ticking. If you're in a big studio in London, the last Cure album that I worked on, we are at Olympic. We had Studio A, B and C going at the same time. There were thousands of pounds being spent every day. And, you, you know, the pressure was on, and I don't think it's always... You know, in fact, I don't like pressure. I like to work in a very... My studio is in... I live in Devon. It's not far from here. I look out the window, I can see cows and trees, <laughs> and I think my music uh, responds to that. So, and also the fact that everybody can do it. Those studios that you're talking about, Olympic, £2,000 a day. What musician can afford that today? And that's why they've all gone out of business. Everybody can afford to buy a, a cheap recording setup at home. It means that everybody can make music, not those few that have got record deals, not those extremely rich bands. 
okay, I'm a part of one of them, but I do my own thing on my own. And I think it's much better for music. There were maybe, okay, so at the height of the recording industry in London, how many studios were there? And they all had four, four rooms, so maybe there were like 40 bands entitled or could afford the best equipment. Now, everybody can afford that. It's got to be better. Well, that, that's interesting because now perhaps success is open to many more people Absolutely. or the potential to, of, of success to make a record and get it out there. Now, we see this being at the sharp end, the end of the road, you know, with, with mastering where we get people from all over the world contacting us a different uh, people you've never heard of and uh, making records and I have to say that that I would that probably 99.9% .9 of them have some kind of extremely successful future I thought it was going to be the other way. <laughs> no. Yeah. I thought it was leaning towards bad. No, I'm glad you no, said no, that. no, no, far, say far that from it. Is the quality, now yeah. that everybody's yeah. making music, is it as good? Well, occasionally you get well, something you really, yeah. a little bit as at that point, that tiny weeny percentage, but I think most people who, uh, you know, are wanting to make records and, and are music, musicians have had some kind of training, even if it's only up to grade eight piano but I mean at least it's going somewhere and they're learning but no I mean I, I think I think you know that, that generally what I'm hearing in a self-made product is extremely good um, well mixed and if not we master it and then they go hmm I think I can mix that better and so on and so but I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. I really am amazed because you would never hear of those people you know, 20 years ago. You'd never hear. You wouldn't even get to. You wouldn't get to hear somebody from Vancouver Island or from some or from Mali perhaps or from, you know, Japan or. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just incredible. I mean, um, all all over and people making records from how you know and, and being able to release them and perhaps being able to make a few bob from record one. And they're just going to get better, and hopefully they're going to come back. I think it's, it's kind of like a question of what you're actually making mm. the record for, the recording for, mm. whether you're making it for yourself, mm. or to sell at gigs, or whether to just put on your Facebook account or something. Mm. And it's a bit mm. like, it's a bit like mm. making a movie. You know, I mm. can shoot a film with my camera, mm. with mm. my telephone, and I can put mm. it on YouTube <coughs> and go and do all the effects and everything, and mm. go, wow, look at that. Mm. But it won't get shown at the cinema. It won't be on release. You know, it won't be no. a, a, a top-notch world. And this is, it's the same. It's the same with making a record. You know, I think that, that you know, you can make you make great stuff at home in your bedroom on your own and get your mates in to do some overdubs. But if you're going to do a do it properly, like a proper film, a feature film, that's going to you know be mega, you you have to go to a studio. Uh, there is an argument that says no. No, I disagree well, entirely. <laughs> uh, some of, uh, some, uh, a very good friend of mine, Jimmy Tamborello, who's got a band called The Postal Service, yeah. records everything at home, sold a million albums. You can't tell the difference anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't, I disagree with that. And what about a young band that are making their first album and they've worked really hard, they've been together you know, for a couple of years, they've toured and stuff, and they feel they're going up the ladder and they've got a manager and they may even have a record company and the record company says, well, we haven't got any money, but you can record it on your laptop in the rehearsal room, can't you? And we'll get a producer in or something, but we're, you know, we're not going to go to a proper studio. Don't you think the musicians would want to go to Abbey Road or Air or yeah, feel but that they inspiration? Can't, they? they can't afford it. If at most they're going to sell they five or ten thousand records. Well, they can't afford it. They're not going to be able to pay for two thousand. They can't afford. They can't afford. Hang on. They can't afford a month. But if they were really good, they could go to Abbey how Road. Much is, how much is the Abbey Road day rate today? It's fifteen hundred pounds. They can't well, afford it. They can't can I, afford can I just it. ask? I'm just curious. Well, how many why of you? Why are they making a record then? Well, hold on. How many of you out there <laughs> just work on themselves. home studios? 
Well, there's your answer. And yeah, how many of you could afford 1,500 quid for a day? How many of how you many, actually how many, in a Can I just say one thing, though? <laughs> how many would like to go to a major studio and, put your, and play yeah, your music right. in a big yeah, studio? Yeah, but that's right. old school. That's because <laughs> you're brainwashed. You don't need it. It's because it's like we were talking about signing a record deal. You don't need the record deal. And you don't need the studio. You need a mastering guy. So yeah, he's not paying me anyway. <laughs> but there's one thing that you can do in the chain that, that seriously, you don't need to go into a studio. Well, <laughs> I don't know about that. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm this, That is the point of this panel, is to... Yes, it is, know, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm no longer a recording engineer, but I, and I, you know, I can see the wisdom of both. In, I can see you know, how good it is to have both. Um, I, I, I just, you know, whether there's a, a, a band I've been working with recently, they recorded in the Czech Republic because they found a room that had a really nice vibe. Um, and, you know, the music, they all play together and they really wanted to play together. They didn't want to do overdubs, they wanted to play together in the studio. So they found this space and it's a really it, it's good, good, it's a good studio. And it has a lovely vibe and, it, and a nice sound and it enabled them to, to communicate with each other and listen, hear each other in such a way that made sense to them. And then the record was then sent to New York and they didn't have any more to do with it. It's been mixed by a chap in New York and it's utterly brilliant. And, you know, so it, this chap just, you know, works in his studio at home. So it, we have both camps who've got both things here both ideas, you know, one and so on. So the, the, the idea of a space where you go and play music is, and if you play together and enjoy playing together, is, is a good thing for yeah, musicians it's, it's, who... Yeah, it's very who, important to feel you know, comfortable in the space that you're working yeah, who, in, but it who, doesn't have to be a studio. It doesn't necessarily have to be a giant recording studio. Um, I, I tell you what, I, I just have to ask, but um, you know, because we're about 50% if you put your hands up about wanting to go into a recording studio. John, could you just <laughs> ask, I want, to, I want to know, just somebody put your hand up and say why. I'm just interested to know why, just from one or two people. Chap in the middle there. Yeah. yeah, that's if, a good point. You okay. see, um, I feel the same. I could probably do, I can do a bit of everything. Um, I've learned that over the years. But I would rather concentrate on the creative side and go to the experts. Mm. Um, I'd rather have a great engineer with some great mics, great equipment mm. in, a, in a good studio. I'd rather go to Simon and have my album mastered. I could have a go myself. You could but, master it yourself on the but, laptop. Mm. You know, these people have spent a whole career. Uh, do, you, do, you think, um, do you think you would be more successful if you went into a recording studio? Uh, well, good question. Yeah. Yeah. I think you would be inspired to go into a room where hit records have been made. You know, this is, I'm not saying you're going to go to Abbey Road, but, you know, you can go into a room and you can feel the vibe of the record that's been done there. And if it's, you know, I think there's a lot to be gained from, and I'm not saying doing the whole record there, but there's a lot to be gained from yeah. the example of a band that's been together for a few years, had a little, you know, maybe done an EP or done some, some release or something, and they go into a studio for a few days, and the, I believe me, because I've done it myself, is that, that, that what you capture and what the, the experience that the band gets just for a thousand pounds, you know, I mean, that's an exaggeration to go in 1,500 pounds a day. But I've done records where, you know, I've said, oh, we're going to go to this studio. And they go, oh, it's too expensive. I said, yeah, but we're only going for five days. And we're going to do the record in five days. And we're going to rehearse for a month before so that when we go in, mm. you're going to do a track in the morning. We're going to start at 11. We're going to do a track before lunch, a track in the afternoon, a track after dinner. And at the end of five days, we'll have 15 tracks done. And then maybe we'll go back to our bedroom and do the vocals and the tambourine and the backing vocals. Uh, and so on. But those five days will be so stimulating to the, to the band and the result you will get, you will never get in a bedroom or a rehearsal room because you're, you're in a controlled space 
that's got... Especially uh, with drums. <laughs> I mean, especially yeah. if you've worked out, you've rehearsed your material, you've recorded a lot of it already onto the laptop or the computer, um, and you just go in for a couple of days. It might but, just but be to lay is, down drum tracks. This is pie in the sky, because this isn't an option. This isn't an option I was for 99% yeah. well, of the bands. <laughs> you shouldn't be making music. Well, no, you oh, shouldn't be wait going. a minute. Hold on a second. Yeah. No, think, what, all of I these people <laughs> sitting here making music in their bedrooms yeah. shouldn't be doing it because no. they can't no. afford a studio. That is nonsense. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I think that. you've got a whole collection that. of individuals <laughs> who know nothing but the bedroom studio and they've perfected that space. Yes, they've and there's got been comfortable in that space. And that's where they're creative. I see you've got your hand up. Isn't that what make, but isn't that what making music's all about? Is It's the, growing it <clears throat> from, from an idea. And does it matter if you make it in a bedroom or in a no, studio? It doesn't. Yes, to get the, the spit and the polish at the end that you're not sure on and to have the advice. But it's about growing the idea and growing the music. And isn't it the bedroom idea to me? Surely that's better to get it down somewhere than to be, oh, I've got to save 1,500 pounds and go and put it in a studio. Well, it, let, me, let me respond this about... way. I think in the same way that we were talking about the idea of success, um, I think a lot of what we do is individual. It's how you perceive what you create, how you uh, perceive that interacting with an audience. Um, it's how you perceive what it should sound like and where, where it ought to end up. I mean, I'm split between all the kind of positions on the stage, what? but... <laughs> but <laughs> I thought you were on my side. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I subscribe to the bedroom studio and the democ democratisation of that whole process. I don't... Having... I had a room in Metropolis for about 10 years, um, which was one of the major studios in London, and, and that turned into a mortgage. Um, and the most creative space on occasions was the bar. Um, and that's where people relaxed, having been in that intense kind of studio area, which everyone was concerned about the cost. Um, and every so often there'd be someone mentioning the cost from the label or whoever, the cost of just being there and ending up with a result. And the bar became the area where you'd find all the musicians, mm. you'd compare what was happening, and you'd chill out and then panic about going back in the room and delivering something. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You can spend hours and what? hours and what? hours on There is a danger, however, with the bedroom studio. <laughs> right? And that is what I call the ego. Right? And they're massive egos which are nurtured and also developed in that space, which then become resistant to outside opinion outside uh, well, communication, interaction, which goes back to what I was saying before. I think if you're making music for yourself, and I think it's a really important point, and by yourself I mean just you, you're making it for your own well, pleasure. That's what That's, we all do, isn't it? Well, actually... Isn't that what we all do? Initially, initially, I think... It's when you start making well, music for other people that this, you run This is where the problems. ego comes in. I think initially we start off with a conversation with ourselves as creatives. You know, it's, it's about me, it's me, and I'm trying to get that out. And at some point, you think about the conversation you're going to have with whoever, the third party. And somewhere down that line, it's about, will I get a response? You know, just applause or payment or whatever. And that's what changes it. For me, if you're making it for yourself, the bedroom's absolutely fine. It's not an issue. If you're going to attempt to communicate to a wider audience, I'm not saying you have to go to the major studio, but I think it becomes a consideration. It's how you perceive that interaction. The, the choice soon won't be an option because the fast won't be any studios. I just want to make the point that we're all from a generation that's we're all of an older age bracket. <laughs> Let's put it that way. There should be some younger people on this panel because there's a whole different approach and we're all, I, I, I've done both. I'm lucky enough to record, to record in the best studios in the world and to really enjoy working at home on a setup that any of you could have. Um, so I can see both sides, but there won't be a choice soon because studios are going the way of the dinosaurs. Don't you think the, the genre of music comes into this though? I mean, there's been some amazing electronic music produced in home studios, mm -hmm. bedrooms. I mean, That's right. you know, Aphex yeah. Twin or Boards of Canada or, or yeah. Tekka. 
anything from the Warp label. I mean, it's just unbelievable electronic music. You don't need to go into a recording mm -hmm. studio. Yeah, that's right. But, you know, if you're making an album with, like, uh, a string quartet, or if you're, if, mm. you know, if sonically it's, it's more ambitious I, I, in, a, in an acoustic sense, then how else can you do I that? I work with a cellist, a uh, world-famous cellist, who's played with everyone. She records in her apartment in New York. She sends me files. Is that solo the, cello? Yeah, but well, it would be the same if there were four of them. I mean, we there are no there. restrictions, mm. quite honestly. There's a lady here who's got a question. The question, question chap Thanks. over there. Thank oh. you. I, I just want to ask you, John, what, what did you mean when you said that people who can't afford the big studios shouldn't be playing music? <laughs> yes! What, what? Because uh, it's a really interesting argument, what? but what did you mean by that? Because that's... He probably votes but, Tory as well. I meant this. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I Now, I probably got, got a bit confused there, because sometimes, sometimes um, <laughs> bands go in the studio and they're not ready. You know, sometimes they, 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 they go into a, a large studio and for whatever reason they're not rehearsed enough or the bass player's not very good or they haven't got the parts sorted out. It's always the bass player, isn't it? <laughs> or the drummer, <laughs> the drummer or something, you know. Don't and tell Simon. Sometimes you kind please. of think, well, the band's not ready to go in the studio. That's what I really meant by that. You can, you can be as you can be rehearsing for months and months and months, but still yeah, not be able to afford that. Yeah, of course it's prohibited. So we sh they shouldn't that, be making records. But what I was trying to get at, if you were if you were ambitious, and you really wanted to make a record that was not just for you, you know, your mates kind of thing, or not just to see, if you wanted to go up a rung on the ladder, then you should look at trying to find £1,500 and it, go into a proper studio and see what it feels like. If see you are a young is. band and you can, for some, you're a young band, there's four of you, and some, by some means you manage to borrow five grand from your parents <laughs> or yeah. whoever. I'm sure there's lots of <laughs> your do that. Yeah. I think it's more what, a case of saving it up from the doll. What <laughs> would you spend that What five would you spend on? it on? Would you, would you blow it on a few days in a studio? Uh, sorry, I'll rephrase that. Would you use it <laughs> on five days in the studio? Wisely. Wisely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to tilt the argument. There's, uh, there's lots of questions. In the, in the yeah. Or would you invest in equipment that you yeah, could yeah. use for yeah. years and years and years make and years. it yeah. hours and yeah. hours of music? Yeah. It just doesn't balance, it does it? On, well, it does, actually, because it yeah, depends. It does. No, it depends on the character of the band and what their yeah. ambitions are and They're whether all they can... Because, well, <laughs> there's, there's a thing about musicians. Musicians used to be musicians, and now they've got to learn how to work computers and run all those things. They've got to be, you know, they've got to be engineers, they've got to be PR, they've got to know how to work every social media. Yes, we accept that. It's part of the job. You don't, you don't just have to choose which, what size velvet trousers you wear anymore. That's, those days of the 70s are gone. You know, you don't look... You I need used to, to like that bit, the velvet trousers. <laughs> <laughs> I still do wear well. mine. But Anyways, you have so to know what's going on. This lady here oh, in the front. Here. But we're gonna, we got a recording session here for £100 a day. They'd earn a special offer, but at full rates, there's no way is that How much is it at full rate, Jim? He's not even here. He's not here. <laughs> but I think it's about £200 a day or something. So it's... it's and and we've done it. recording. We've either on there or half a day at a full price. It's OK just to do, like, two, three songs. Obviously, if you're doing an album, it's going to cost a lot of money. But it is possible. It's not thousands of pounds, and it's a good yeah. studio. Mm -hmm. But I yeah, also that was... think that, that to be able to have the equipment at home... Like, I know a lot of very talented people that live in Exeter, and it was always used to be, you either going to be famous and you're going to do it. And I think it enables people to make music that wouldn't be able to do it before. Then, mm. then what they do with that music, if it gets it out there, mm. it gets them in the position to record it the way they should. That's brilliant. They, uh, you, they'll, they'll do that demo on their home equipment, then they'll get a deal, they'll get totally ripped off by the record labels, they'll go and blow thousands and thousands in a studio, give points away to producers, and they'll end up nowhere they'll end up no further ahead than if they'd continued down the route that they started on. No, it's interesting. Mm. Anyway. No, <laughs> John, <laughs> no offence. I think, I think what we should own up to is that um, where we started out, because 
we're of a similar vintage. And where we are... <laughs> That's vintage, <laughs> not he's, age. He's older than me. Um, <laughs> except then and now are really completely different uh, worlds in terms of music. And in terms of uh, the individual's approach, even the concept of the musician has changed. Mm -hmm. The concept of the band has changed. The concept of success has changed. How we achieve uh, the various criteria for those has changed also. Um, so I kind of, it, and the cost has mm -hmm. changed. So 200 pounds for many musicians, um, when they look at recording several tracks, is still a lot of money. And they will offset that about, against buying new equipment and say, you know, like you're saying, is it relevant? I think increasingly the musician is multi-purposed. It's not just about um, learning your chops as a musician. It is about now being more rounded in terms of the industry. Um, and there's an argument to say that if you had 5,000 pounds, you'd set up your own label. Um, you'd record your own album and you'd look at uh, making your own videos. Absolutely. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a different world. If it's anybody ever process. wants any help setting up record labels or publishing, I'm very happy to get involved. Mm. It's not difficult and it doesn't take a lot of money and you can self-release. Don't give your money to those idiots. Uh, give it to Roger. <laughs> <laughs> I am an idiot, I admit it. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm a skin music student and a musician, and I'm carrying on for your point, John, that you said that musicians have to be everything these days. We have to do all our own kind of mixing and recording. We have to do it all ourselves. I'm lucky enough to study at a music school in Exeter, and um, they've taught me how to record and mix and master properly, and I'm really, really glad of that. But I'm aware that there's a lot of young artists around here that don't know how to do it, and they've bought themselves studio equipment, but they're not doing it properly. They're just kind of half, kind of doing it half... That's properly. Right. And I think it's really important that we mustn't forget like, the technique behind it. It is difficult, and I think a lot of young artists need to be taught it as well. So mm. I think that's a big gap. But is it, isn't it better to be doing it badly than to not be doing it at all? Yeah, and sure, you are learning from it, but I think there is a massive gap in the market as such. For, for what? Tuition? For tuition, yeah. I'm lucky enough to have been taught it. £100 an hour. I'll take anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that goes back to what I was saying earlier about recognising success. I think... What, one of the things that happened with the bedroom studios is musicians and creatives, I prefer the term creatives, disconnected with fellow creatives. And I think it's really important in today's market to recognise what you can't do. And the truth is, you don't have to learn that. You simply need to recognise someone that can and make them a friend. Um, that's really, really important uh, these days. And then to recognise specialists. Um, and you have your peers who will specialise in engineering, specialising in mastering, and make them... The new band, actually, is a very different makeup. It would include uh, perhaps a video maker, a photographer, uh, what we call the geek who's into the technology, who specialises in making the sound, sound design, um, and then the musician. It's a very different makeup today, I would argue. That's good. So uh, what, um, what role would Ringo have happen? <laughs> He's still the drummer. <laughs> I'm, I'm very much with Roger on, on this, but, yes. but what I do do is I go into recording studios to record really pretty much drums. That's the only thing that I don't do at home. Hmm. Everything else, guitars, the whole lot, I bring, in, bring musicians in, but the only thing that I actually need a, a, an acoustic space for, which I haven't got at home, I mean, in, a, in a sort of you know, a, a home studio is, is, is the drum booth, in effect. And to, what about the other members of your band? They all, they all come... Well, they all come in. We, we, we go and record a guide track with the drummer, so, but we're really, only, we're, only, we're only only interested in recording the drum track. That gets done probably over a two-day period in the studio, and we, I think last time we recorded 12 tracks in two days. But we're only con concentrating on the drums. Everything else gets replaced and gets done in the home studio. But then, I'm, I'm just curious, um, in terms of bands, mm -hmm. would it be fair to say that you conform to the kind of traditional concept, the band? Where... Uh, yes, we're a, girl, we're a, girl, we're a girl, fronted, girl fronted pop group. Okay. And again, just to get an idea of the, who we've got in the room, how many uh, of you would say you conform to the traditional band, where you've got musicians, 
that work together collectively. Mm. Guitar, bass, and drums. And See, and somewhere yes. in between there, not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it, but that would suggest the majority of you are not. Um, would it be fair to say that you'd come on the? Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to find a term here, but um, <laughs> you're trying to be polite. <laughs> Uh, just one well, thing, have you tried BFD drums? Uh, yes, I have. I prefer drum call. Oh, I start, I, I start um, the, the, the writing process, I'm using something like drum, I use drum call and then they're, they're replaced by the real drum. Yeah, there are some great drum samples. You don't need drummers. Really. <laughs> there you go. I was trying to get there politely. But. <laughs> <laughs> there's a drum sample program called BFD. I don't know if anyone knows it. It's an English company. They're from the East End. And, and the drum samples are incredible. Of course, it comes down to the way they play them, but the sound quality is unbelievable. Well, I'll tell you what I do. I go into a big, expensive studio <laughs> with a band, and I record the drums... And then I go home and replace them all with BFD. Excellent. <laughs> I do, really. <laughs> See, he's getting there. <laughs> That's true. You just blown the myth. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Most then, drummers do hate me. Does this mean the majority of musicians, creatives, producers in this room are, would come from more ele electronic background? Just show of hands so we get an idea. Both. I think, yeah, I oh, think that, you, you know, when Thank I started you. making music, rock was there, folk was there, jazz was over there, no, over there, left side. <laughs> and, and the idea of combining any of them was, was insane. When I first heard of, um, when I first heard My Vishnu Orchestra, which was like uh, rock, jazz, fusion, everybody was like, these guys, they're playing rock, but they're like jazz musicians. But now there's no, there are no to say who's in a traditional band is not really valid anymore because everybody's the, the, everything's so blurred mm. and also so fragment so fragmentized fragmented <laughs> <Whatever. laughs> yeah. just to go back to the previous uh, point when we were asking you questions um, suppose that your your act your band whatever um, you had real interest from a record label, and they said, we, we really believe in you. Um, we're going to give you a uh, £150,000 advance. Um, would you go into a top studio, or would you buy your home equipment and divvy up the money? Spend it on velvet trousers, I think. <laughs> well, so I, I mean, sounds. bearing in mind that you don't, you owe them it, but you don't owe them it if you don't make that money. Mm. Yeah. Good choice. But the chances of you getting £150,000 advance <laughs> are zero. Maybe yeah. 15. Yeah. No, people have. People have done that, yeah. But there are people out there that, that if you... I'm going to phrase this but, but, properly. But, but, but that answer, <laughs> that enough, answer implies that you wanted... You yeah. Hey, but the when answer was the last time you heard of a £150,000 advance? If to an unknown band. <laughs> if the band is good, is, is good Tell enough. Tell me who and when. Well, I, <laughs> I can't... It, I can't doesn't, it doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't, it, you don't get advances. Nobody mm. gives advances. We, I've recorded in a house, and so did Radiohead. They used it after us. I got but, an advance last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, publishing advances. If, if your band but, is shit hot, they will give you 150 grand plus. If you are shit hot, and that's what you should be. You should aspire <coughs> to be in that. But yeah, I aspire to be in that. <laughs> I try my best. <laughs> but we've recorded in a house, and it's, um, we're, you know, the cure we... Um, rented uh, a house in Bath and we were there for two years so that wasn't very economic <laughs> and uh, then after we left uh, Radiohead came in did you do that one? I know the place, Jane Seymour's yeah, Jane place Seymour's house. and then we went back there again for another three years so it didn't really add up economically but recording. it cost us a fortune <laughs> We could have bought it. We could have, actually. We've See, if you'd gone into Abbey Road for five days, you would have done <laughs> it. We'd have finished it. Well, then, the, the last album that I recorded with them, like I said, we were in um, Olympic for three months with three studios, which cost unbelievable amounts of money. Mm. 
I think what we're saying is that music industry success does still comes in <laughs> lots of different guises. That's right. And it's uh, and obviously it's it's entirely a personal choice how you go about making your music. And uh, these days it's a big wide world, and there are lots and lots of opportunities to mm -hmm. to do it. But I'm just curious word. because we've mm -hmm. just been talking about money and the cost of recording. <clears throat> um, how many of you are doing it for the money? Ooh. No, <laughs> well, no at this point we say, can you put your hands up here? <laughs> well, there's yeah, nothing wrong with it. You know, no, no it's just, I'm just it's curious, Stan, because it was one of the measures of success was whether you could get that big deal. Mm. So I'm just mm. curious how many of you are actually still chasing that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Just to make yeah. a living. Mm. And that's, that's, that's a very acceptable goal for mm. a career, well, mm. a career mm. choice or, or a profession. And I think and there's a lot of famous people and successful people who would actually be happy to do that as well. I mean, they've got the success, okay, but if it meant going back just to being able to survive doing that, such is their love for music, that, that I think they'd do that. It's very hard for their egos. I've been around those people that have fallen after being up there. And they're not happy people. <laughs> We've got a question, the guy in the middle there. Um, hi, yeah. Um, I'd like to pick up on the point that Michael made about the personal disconnection of being in a bedroom studio. Um, I actually find working with technology and with the internet especially that I've connected with people from all around the world that I've collaborated with um, uh, who've got different skills and are working in different genres of music that I've never have had the opportunity to about 10 years ago. Exactly. No, File I, sharing. I, I totally applaud that and, and I support that uh, approach to kind of networking and uh, this whole social networking through electronic medium. But I've also encountered um, the kind of negative side of that, um, which is uh, kind of ego coupled with uh, a level of uh, well, delusion that is paramount to, to like failure. Like we said, we're all <laughs> deluded. It's, it, and it, it's, it's, it's really important, certainly uh, as a lecturer, um, that we have students for what, three years, right? and the music industry over that period changes hugely. What changes less is often that individual and their approach to what they, what they do. If we recognize that uh, an individual is hell-bent on just being the individual, that's not necessarily a problem. It's where it's to the point where uh, it's the exclusion of everything and everyone around them. Um, and uh, there's, there's a slightly other stage where that individual, we recognize that by the age of 25, um, certainly amongst males, they tend to, how can I put this subtly, uh, settle into a routine, um, which is very difficult to uh, nudge them one way or the other. If that routine is on a trajectory that we envisage, it's not that we can tell the future, but we envisage is, the road to doom, um, we will try and inform them to communicate, to perhaps have friends, perhaps communicate, work in a group, um, because it's, it's, we, we see that it's been to the benefit. Um, but we do recognise that increasingly there is a challenge that if they don't change before the age of 25 and, and just be more open, that they can be on a pathway which goes from it being a hobby to becoming part of a personality. Um, and that personality trait then takes them into their 40s, wherever. But um, I'd just like to say, every major star that I've ever met or worked with fits that exact description that you identified there. They're completely out of touch with the world. It's like they've lived in their bedrooms their whole lives. I, I think that's necessary well, for the huge kind of you can, when you walk into a room and, and there's somebody there, you know, somebody, David Bowie or whoever, like everybody's been around them, sorry. They are the, the huge ego that's, they're like a black hole. They suck everything into it. And that's how they become so huge and successful. 
You can't tell a kid that's got a huge ego in his bedroom, you've got to get out and meet people because you're going nowhere. Tell him to keep doing what he's doing because well, he's going to he's, stand as a chance. I mean, how, all of us, we've all worked with huge egos. I'm not Sorry. naming any names. <laughs> Yes. I know what you're saying. If you don't have the ego, yeah. when you go and stand on stage and you're at the front and you're singing to 50,000 people, you better have a fucking ego, otherwise you're going to be destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is a flip side of that. Is that you cannot satisfy these egos. Which no, is the flip I, I am aware of that. <laughs> I try on a daily basis. Right, and all I'm saying is that we have them for 36 months or so. And what we're trying to say is, look, you know, if you're going to make that career, that term, there needs to be some level of balance. If you don't recognise your own ego, but that's... Uh, in, in, a, in your effort to be successful, there is a real danger. That's, that's what, you're, what you do, which I respect. <laughs> to make that sound like I do. <laughs> Running these kind of rock schools. Is, We're not a rock school. Okay, a music school. <laughs> it's defining a, a career route of somebody... Okay, take Robert Smith. <laughs> right. Let's. If he went to rock school, he wouldn't be doing it what he's doing now, would he? None of the people that we know came through that kind... You can't pinpoint somebody's abilities when they're in their early 20s and say, you're doing this wrong. If you do this, if you, if you don't do it like this, you're not going to be this intangible thing, this megastar, this hugely creative person. He didn't make creative records person. in his bedroom either, did he? Yeah, he did. Did he? Yeah. Oh. There you go. Did he? There's a question at the back here, <laughs> right at the back. Well, of course they did. They didn't have a record. They didn't have a, stu they didn't have a recording contract at the beginning. Everybody turned the cure down. Like every great band. But they went to a demo studio. No, it was in Robert's parents' oh, garage. There we go. <laughs> anyway, question at the back. Hi. I'm probably the most uncreative person here. I do security. Uh, I see bands come and go on a daily basis. Uh, how much of success is down to pure luck? Um, take Jeff Beck, the Truth album. If he hadn't have hurt his foot and couldn't go on tour with John Mayall's Blues Breakers, he wouldn't have been in the studio with all of those other great artists and those friends that he had around him wouldn't have been there to create that album. Rod Stewart doing vocals, mm. Roy Wood doing what he does and all those other people that just contributed yes. into that album. But would he have gained success without that album? And was that luck, good luck, bad luck? Mm. And would it have happened without it? There's no such thing as luck. It's no, no, there is. Sorry, Roger. Not. It's a matter no, of being in, it's, <laughs> it's a matter of being in the right place, no, Simon. Right, 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 right place at the right time and having the right attitude. We have I've a definition, in, Rog. I've been in five major bands, and it's mm. all been about being in the right place. That it's not necessarily about my ability. I can play, but I'm not the greatest player. No, there's no such thing as luck. No, there is, Rog. <coughs> there is. No, no, can I give you a definition? <coughs> luck. Oh, okay, let's talk about religion. <laughs> there's no such thing as God, and there's no such thing as luck. Okay, can I give you my offer? It's can I offer my definition. Luck. Of what? It, luck or God? <laughs> I'll be lucky to get this in. Um, um, yeah, you got uh, ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> now it's, it's just a second. We we have a. A way of defining luck. We say it's where preparation meets opportunity. If you were not prepared when you were in these situations, you couldn't exercise the opportunity. So I would argue that you've made your own luck. No, you haven't. By being prepared. Luck. That's not a definition of luck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it isn't. <laughs> well, help, help me out here, please. <laughs> well, <laughs> Does, um, got... does anyone agree with that? If you're prepared when opportunity presents itself, yeah. you can. Mm -hmm. But that's not luck. Yeah. That's being well, exactly. prepared. I mean, exactly. In answer that's to your not question, luck, the definition. Is it? It's it, not luck. It, there is. It, Jeff, Jeff Beck would have been successful whether anyway. anyway. You, you'd hope so, wouldn't you? Such based a, on uh, being prepared. Based, based on being, being brilliant. Yeah. Um, but Which doesn't yes, happen in luck, a second. luck does come into it. Yeah that sometimes there are certain circumstances that can be beneficial. And if you have got the inspiration and the talent at that time to shine and make something happen, 
then that takes you a big step forward, mm -hmm. more so than if that circumstance hadn't happened. So definitely luck. Definitely, definitely, definitely like people who <laughs> you come into contact with, certain people you meet, that can affect things as well. But all the while, you've, you've got to be ready for it. And I think your description was spot on. Yeah. Thanks, Roger. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, there's no such thing as luck. If anybody's worried about or ladders or, or Friday the 13th... Any other questions? Or rabbit feet, <laughs> you're in the wrong Hello. room. Hello. Roger, I think that you're, you're right to a degree when it comes to the internet, but you can bring your own luck via the internet. The internet has now enabled, and that's why I think the big word is enable, someone who is an enabler, like yourself, John, you, you make things happen. And like you, Simon, you make stuff happen. And I think a lot of the money is in enabling other people to, to express their ego. I think a lot of it, I mean, I, I, I sit at home and I, I create patches and I sell patches on the internet for synths and things like that. And I enable other people to shine. And I think that's where all of the panel kind of come from their own kind of point of view, but it's still about enabling themselves and other people via look and the internet and everything else. Can, can somebody give me a, a scientific explanation of luck? <laughs> well, no, I, 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 I yeah, yes. but let, let's just stop the, the stop, let's just stop, right. stop the luck we thing. I mean, the, 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 you know, we are, we are, we are lucky. You know, we're, we're, we're this word lucky. You know, we are lucky to be here. We are lucky. We're I am lucky to live where I do. But I got to where I have got by, hard by work. sheer hard luck and being in the right place at the right time and um, very, very, you know, focusing very hard on what I wanted to do. And I think that everybody's doing that. And I think that's uh, whether we call it luck or anything else, it doesn't matter. But, you know, the point is that what you're doing is you're actually focusing on something and you will bring, you will enable, great word, I like that one. This is a very, in, this is a, a great word for today's world of the internet and in people enabling other people to, to communicate. It's a terrific word, you know, perhaps that's another word, a more, uh, a more modern word for luck perhaps is enabling. It's, it's great. Question yeah. Hi, sorry to bang <coughs> on about luck. I really am. <laughs> but um, yeah. at the music school I, I go to, um, there's a guy called Tom Matthews, and um, he had videos up on YouTube, kind of his covers and his originals and stuff. And he, he's excellent, he's a fabulous musician. But there are a lot of people on YouTube. A researcher from the Alan DeGeneres show in America happens to click on his video and thought, hang on, he's really good. He's now like living in America and like LA recording every day. He's got thousands of pounds because his YouTube video is in the right place at the right time. And that was through preparation, which is Michael's point. Mm -hmm. Which is Can, I, can, I, can yeah. I just follow it's up on that? It's preparation. It's preparation. Preparation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An, an enabler is skilled mm. in whatever area they, they are, mm. which then enables themselves to move on. And in, in terms of, you know, I don't want to harp on the, the luck thing, but... Um, Seems so like you are. One, one of our, our students, um, uh, writer, composer, musician, uh, guitarist, um, used to make lots of tracks and he, he'd work with anyone uh, just so that he could get his guitar on their track or just make another recording. One of those recordings found, it, found its way to Jay-Z and eventually became New York's State of Mind. Now, he'd sent out the track or handed it out or whatever perhaps two years before this happened and he says he had no part in that track finding its way to JC. Um, but that track became New York State of Mind, and on the back of that, he moved from Shepherd's Bush in London to LA. Now, we can describe that as luck. I would describe that as the hard work that he put in initially, um, you know, that he invested, that he enabled himself to use that word. Just uh, uh, going back to the time. definition of success thing, it's come up twice now. So he's moving to LA, a definition of success. Not for me. <laughs> That's not luck. Let's not, let's not get carried away here. Question here. You can't sit in your bedroom and think, I'm really lucky. I'm going ma to get somewhere with my music. I'm a lucky bloke. Don't do that. I just, agree with you. Just work hard. Send your music. And being in the right place at the right time is not lucky either. It's establishing those places where you need to be and being there, not wasting your time. Targeting people that you know can be useful to you and using them. 
That sounds a bit... <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. Don't hang around with people that are not going to further your career, you're, if you're career-minded. If you just want to have a laugh, do what you want. I was kind of going to say something related to that, actually, in that um, a few years ago I started my degree in sound and music technology and I had very little equipment at home. And I think one of the main reasons that a lot of people want to get into a studio is for the resources, both the, the resources of people and of equipment. But what I've been trying to do over the last few years is to, to kind of help my local... When I say community, I don't mean like going down to a local community centre. I mean my friends and their friends, you know, my, my immediate community. But I've got friends who are guitarists, and they've come around and left a couple of guitars at my house because I got some recording equipment. And I had a friend who had a mixing desk who said, oh, do you want that there? And we've started to kind of build a collection of equipment that everybody can use. And, I, you know, I can do a bit of you know, play this and that, but I, I tend to help them with the techno technological side of it because I'm the kind of geek in the, in the friendship group. Um, and my girlfriend is a photography student, you know, and we're all trying to help each other. So we're still getting the access to the equipment and the access to the resources, but it is free and it is community-based and it is in our own environment, in our own time, you know, and I think that is a, is a nice kind of middle ground between having to be in an, you know, a, a very developed environment and in your bedroom with a couple of bits and pieces. But it does require people to help each other and to kind of try to think how they can share their skills with other people and network. And then it's amazing what you can achieve on a low budget in a small environment, I think. Just don't let success get into that equation because it will ruin it. Yeah. <laughs> but you've defined the new, what I call the new band, yeah. the, you know, the, the components of that. And coupled with that, when you say the geek, because uh, I use that term as well, it's, it's how you use technology to stay in communication. And local, we now look as, uh, as national, and national we look at as just international, the world. So your community, if you like, is people like yourself anywhere on the planet. And it's, it's kind of embracing that in terms of the conversation you have musically. Um, was, so like I, Roger, I totally support what you're saying. Yeah, and like Roger said, I do try to find good musicians, people who, who, are, who have the dedication and the kind of the skills who want to achieve something. Because I'm well aware that if they're in my studio and they manage to make success of themselves, I'll be along with them for the ride. Or I might make a success myself. And if I do, I intend to bring the people with me who helped me along the way. You know, out of all can of I those. just ask a question there? If you had the option of money yeah. injected into your project or people, hmm. What would you opt for? If you could, you know, point out who, I, in terms I mean, of individuals. I don't know. I mean, ideally, I'd like to have my own studio that I could help people with. You know, I'd, not not necessarily a completely open community-based project, but you know, I I like sharing my knowledge and my resources with people, and that's my motivation. It's not to be rich. It's to to enjoy the process of working with other people. I think you know, I I like the fact that there's different musicians each week coming through and I get to meet them and learn what they do and how they do it and their approach to things and that feeds back into my own practice but um, and to me that's the drive you know working with people every day and yeah. and having that interaction as an artist I'm, I mean I know a lot of people like working individually but I, st I, I when I make my own music I tend to work by myself but I really enjoy working with other people helping them to achieve what they want to achieve because a lot of musicians have you know, a lot of skill, but they have no idea how to document that on record. And I don't know, it's like being a, a painter and having great ideas, but not actually being able to paint them. You know, it's, Can I, I just know. ask you another question then? Yeah. If you had the opportunity to be on something, I don't know, on a TV, like X Factor, or... I would never do that in a million years. <laughs> or, I'm sorry, I'd or perform at a major festival. Yeah. And I ask this in context of the size of the audience yeah. and the potential of that audience to then give you what you want in terms of career, in brackets. Um, so if you had the choice between accessing maybe 8 million, <coughs> 4 to 8 million as an audience on TV, or 1 to 3,000 at a festival, or 50,000 at a festival, what, what would you opt for? I, don't, I, I would, really wouldn't want to be on X Factor if I was offered a million pounds. I just, I no, literally, no, this it's, is not it's money. horrible. No, no, this is not money. This no, is but, access um, to a potentially large audience. But you know, what, oh. what audience would you have? You'd be that guy of X Factor, wouldn't you? Yeah. You know yeah. I mean? You'd never have any integrity. You'd never have a real There's career. no good reason for being There's, on any You would never, <laughs> ever want to do that. It wouldn't give me any satisfaction at Can all. Can I just break this out to everyone in the room? Just festival, live performance, or TV? Uh, uh, just how many would go for the festival? 
Uh, can I just add as well, a friend of mine's band just won a big competition um, to play at Groves Rock, which is a big rock festival in, in uh, Belgium, I believe. Um, and I mean, it's a really big festival, and they're very lucky to have won the ticket to play on the main stage. Yeah, uh, oh, but they're on the main stage? I, I, well, I don't know. If, uh, they're on a big stage anyway. Yeah, it's, unfortunately, it's getting to play on festivals is not... For no. smaller bands, you get lost. Well, this is the thing. They've not only that, although they won the competition, they're not paying for their travel out to the festival, <laughs> and they only get a ticket for the day they're playing. The other two days, they get booted out. And, Quite right. Know, how, one, one day they're going to be standing on stage playing to people, and then they're going to be booted out the next day. Yeah, festival, well, how, uh, how are you supposed to make your money? Festivals aren't so good for, for small bands. No. No. Um, I think we just one more question because I think we're a few minutes over here. Yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> um, I just wanted uh, a sort of general question about you talking about studios and saying we should go into them. Do you think there's a, a negative side to it on the creative side? Because I know someone who did their first album, went into a studio, really felt intimidated, didn't like what came out because she felt she was being told what to do and didn't <coughs> have much input. Uh, and then when she wanted to do another album, she came round and we'd been working in my studio. Mm. And she felt much more Comfortable. alive with that. Right. And the two of us worked, we ended up collaborating. And she just felt she got a much, what she re recorded at the end was what she mm. was and what her songs were. That's and great. she just felt that going into a studio, she was being held back and they weren't really interested in her and it was just another product. I Did she know the people who were working on the music? Um, she she knew the producer, but he was bringing in session people to play and mm. you know, mm. she'd say, it well, you're sounds... going to do, do this for me. And he said, oh yes, and of course it never got done. And it sounds like they might have been a bit condescending and a bit well, um, yeah. pressurising. She'd often never been happens. in a studio as well, and yeah. so you feel intimidated. That often happens, and it happens to girls a lot. Yeah. Whereas in, in my studio, industry. it's just the two of us. No, but sometimes <laughs> there's, there, is, there has been vibes yeah. in studios, you know, where uh, people aren't really respected and... But, mm. you know, they don't know what they're doing, I'll, you know. But it, it just sort of... And I can see that, but, you know, hopefully it doesn't, you know, affect her confidence, and obviously she's doing yeah. fine now. And, yeah. Mm. And, and this goes um, back to what you're saying about people reacting with people. Yeah, that can we, happen, but... The two of us work together, and, and it's great. We'll go in, and I'll, she'll do something, and I'll work on it, and if, it, mm. if she hates it, she'll come back and say, no, that's wrong. Don't do that. We'll do this. We yeah. won't go there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she's got the confidence in, in a small studio with the two of us to do that. Yeah. And she's getting much more out of it. Okay, if she suddenly becomes famous, she'd probably want to go to the studio, but at the moment... Yeah, then she'll tell them what to do. <laughs> yeah, probably would, yes. But it, it just enables her more, back to that word, to do and to perform the songs as she sees them and how she hears them in her head and how she wants it to come out. Yeah. So okay. just, I just would like to ask everyone, of all the people that are making music, uh, I mean, do you all want a career in music? And what would a career? What does a career in music mean to you? Does it mean just a living wage, or does it mean like huge success? Would it just be sufficient to be able to live from making your music? That's what I'm guessing. This girl that I was talking about, her, her main aim, she's a just to make money, just to make a living. Is that what everybody thinks? Yeah. I miss the what? No. And, and uh, obviously, if that's the other, on the other side, whoever the person is, is uh, that's distressing for other people. And, and that you can't make a, a living. I'm guessing that most of the people here aren't making a living from music. Am I wrong? So, do you think that you should? Who, who, what do you think's gone wrong that you can't make a living? Can you? Who is? Well, you're living from making music. Yeah. So, four out of a hundred? <laughs> that's normal. <laughs> <laughs> what, do, what, what, would, what would be the biggest change to everyone else in the room that's making music and not making a living that would allow them to make a living? I mean, would it be... St Can I just Excellent. ask a, a left-field question? Um, how many... Uh, of you out there as producers, writers are into kind of bass music? Dubstep? Okay. 
I, I'm currently working with UKF um, Dubstep. So if uh, there's anything you want to uh, send me, you can get my details off Jim. Um, uh, they're constantly looking for new writers, producers, artists, music. Um, just get my details off Jim and, and send me something. And who knows, you might have a direct conversation with them. If anybody wants to further any <laughs> conversations with me, not about luck, about <laughs> starting a record label or um, pr a publishing company or anything like that, um, I've got some cards. And I might, you can find me on the internet anyway. There you go. Okay. Um, I think that's about all we've got time for now. We've gone over about 10 minutes. So uh, thank you all for coming. It's been a great audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.